We now move on to the epic. The epic. You have your course outline. We are going to study the Iliad and the Odyssey. We are going to study the Iliad and the Odyssey. By Homer. The two points are written by Homer. But first, let us attempt a definition of the epic. Let us attempt a definition of the epic. The epic can be defined the epic can be defined as a long narrative poem. The epic can be defined as a long narrative poem. Written in an elevated style. Written in an elevated style. Making use of flowering language. Flowery language. Making use of flowery language. Written in an elevated style. Making use of flowery language. And used to praise heroic deeds. And used to praise heroic deeds. I'll check that again. The epic is a long narrative point. Written in an elevated style. Using flowery language. And used to praise heroic deeds. And used to praise heroic deeds. First, the definition emphasizes the length of the epic in the word long. First, the definition emphasizes the length of the epic in the word long. Long. This means that this means that the epic is the longest type of poetry. This means that the epic is the longest type of poetry and that the length is necessary for its features for its identity, for its understanding. The length is necessary for its feature and for its identity. So the first thing you notice about the epic is the length, how long it is. In fact, today, in fact, today, when anything is quite long, we say that it is epic in nature. When anything is quite long, we say it is epic in nature. For instance, we can have an epic class. That means it was so long, it looks as if it will never end. Right? We can have an epic sermon. Okay, which means that the pastor took a long time to preach. Right? Good. So, the epic was um, so long that it was organized in books. Not one book, not two books, not three books. 
that it was so long that it was organized in books. As many as 10 to 12 books could make up one epic poem. As many as 12 books could make up one epic poem, right? And it could not be read in one day. It could not possibly be read in one, one day because it was that lengthy. But the amazing thing about the length of the epic is that despite how lengthy it was, the amazing thing about the epic is that despite how lengthy it is or it was, people were able to, people were able to Compose it Memorized it We were able to compose it Memorize it And then Recite it Recite it through memory Recite it through memory <coughs> whenever the occasion called for it. Whenever the occasion called for it. So we never underestimate the power of the human mind or the power of the human memory. We never underestimate the power of the human mind and the power of the human memory. Right. So another, another term in the definition of the epic that we should elucidate on is narrative. 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 If you get to the definition, if you go back to the definition of the epic, you see the word narrative. This means that. This means that the epic tells a story. The epic is a narrative point because it tells a story. Epic is a narrative point because it tells a story. A work of art is Consider narrative when it tells a story. The work of art is described as narrative when it tells a story. The work of art is described as narrative when it tells a story. So a narrative poem tells a story. Another term that we need to um, consider in the definition is the elevator style. Elevator style. That talks about the style of the epic, which is grand. That talks about the style of the epic, which is what? Which is grand. Grand. G R A N D. Grand. Elevator style talks about the the style of the epic, which is grand. So the epic makes use of grand style. The epic makes use of grand style. The style of the epic is grand. By grand style, we mean elevator style. 
In an elevated style, the language is dignified and refined. In an elevated style, the language is dignified and refined. In an elevated style, the language is dignified and refined. This means that the epic does not make use of ordinary everyday language or the language of the common people. This means that the epic does not make use of ordinary everyday language or the language of the common people. This means that an epic does not make use of ordinary everyday language or the language of the common people. Rather, the epic makes use of the language of the upper class members of society. The epic makes use of uh, the language of the upper class members of society, refined language, refined language, language that is defined through high level education, high educational attainment, the language that only the elite can speak and understand. The language of the epic is formal. The language of the epic is formal. The epic makes use of what? Formal language. The epic makes use of formal language. The epic makes use of formal language. Formal language. It is not informal, it is formal. That's part of the grand style. That is part of the grand style. This language has dignity, it has decorum. It's a, a language that is used for important public occasion. Language suitable for important public occasion. Language suitable for important public occasions. So the style of the epic is on it. It's on it. It's flowery because it is beautiful. It's flowery because it is beautiful. It is decorative. It's on it, it is decorative, it beautifies, it is, it's full of aesthetics. It's decorative, it is beautiful, it's full of aesthetics. It is suitable for eulogy, for praise. It is suitable for eulogy, suitable for praise. It is suitable for eulogy or for praise. Note that the epic is used to praise heroic deeds of heroes in battle. 
The epic is used to praise heroic deeds of brave men in battle. This means that the epic does not describe the life of common people. The epic is used to discuss the life of highly placed members of society. The epic is not used to discuss the lives of common people. The epic is used to discuss the life of highly placed members of society. The epic is used to discuss the lives of highly placed members of society, like kings, like queens, like princes and princesses. The epic is usually written by bards. The epic is usually written by bards. Bards. The epic is usually written by bards. B A R D S. B A R D S. Bards. Bards are. Bards are poets. Bards are poets. It's another name for a poet. A bard is a poet. These bards usually accompanied the king to the battlefield. These bards usually accompany the king to the battlefield. Or the king, conscious of their immortality, warriors, knights, conscious of their immortality, usually took they bars to the battlefield. They took the bars to the battlefield. The reason is that they want these bars to observe firsthand the bravery, the spectacular bravery of these warriors, these kings, these knights. And the reason is that they will be able to put this act of bravery into what? Poetry. We need to put the act of poetry, um, act of bravery into poetry. To praise them in poetry. To describe the heroic deeds in poetry. The epic usually begins with an invocation of the muse. The epic usually begins with an invocation of the muse. The epic usually begins with an invocation of the muse. The muse is the goddess of poetry, a supernatural source of inspiration for poets. Supernatural source of inspiration for poets. A supernatural source of inspiration for poets. The muse, the goddess of poetry, was a supernatural source of inspiration for poets. It was believed that poetry was an inspired art. It was believed that poetry was an inspired art. It was believed that poetry was an inspired art. This means that the poet could not write without inspiration from a supernatural force, which was the muse. This means that the poet could not write without an inspiration from a supernatural force, in this case, the muse.
And so the first thing that the and so the first thing that the poet does is to invoke the muse. Is to invoke the muse. It's the opening part of the poem. The invocation of the muse is the opening part of the poem. In this invocation, in this invocation, the poet calls on the muse to take over the writing process. The poet calls on the muse to take over the writing process. In this invocation, the poet calls on the muse to take over the writing process. To take over the writing process. So that it will not be the poet writing, it will be the muse writing. After that, after that, the epic poetry begins in media's rage. After that, the epic poetry begins in media's rage. After that, the epic poetry begins in media's rage. That is in the middle of things. That is in the middle of things. In media's rage is the struck is the is the plot structure of the epic. In media's rest is the plot structure of the epic. In media's rest is the struct is the plot structure of the epic. The epic usually begins in the middle of things. In the middle of the events. And then the story is told towards the beginning and then to the end. And then the story is told towards the beginning and then to the end. So if you're asked of what type of plot we usually have in the epic, say it is in the middle of things in media's way. The epic usually features warriors, heroes in the battlefield. The epic usually features warriors, heroes in the battlefield. In the first place, the epic is organized in books and canto. In the first place, the epic is organized in books and canto. In the first place, the epic is organized in books and canto. Each book can have up to five cantos. Each book can have up to five canto or more. So that is the organization of the epic. So that is the organization of the epic. As I said, the epic usually features warriors in the battlefield, heroes in the battlefield. And they may fight against fellow men and sometimes they do fight against supernatural forces. Sometimes they fight against fellow men and sometimes they fight against supernatural forces. They, they do fight against faith. They do battle with faith, F-A-T-E. Because, you see, the world of the epic is fatal. The world of the epic is fatal. 
In the epic, events are fated. In the epic, events are fated. Fated events cannot be stopped or reversed. When an event is fated, it's fated. When an event is fated, it cannot be stopped or reversed. It is bound to happen. When an event is fated, it cannot be stopped or reversed, but it is bound to happen. In the epic, we usually have the intervention of the supernatural. In the epic, we usually have the intervention of the supernatural. In human affairs, the epic usually have the inter intervention of the supernatural in human affairs. That means that the gods do intervene in man's affairs. The gods do intervene in man's affairs. So these gods, particularly in Greek and Roman poetry, play important role. These gods, particularly in Greek and Roman poetry, play important role. Which is why we are going to pause here and when we meet again, we will look at the Roman, the Greek and the Roman pantheon. Look at the Greek and the Roman pantheon. Because the understanding of the Jew of the Roman pantheon will enable you to understand the point that we will study. So good morning, class. Right.